All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to this first session of a joint initiative between the University of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, we've been working together in informal ways and in more formal ways uh, for many, many years, but we thought the time had come to take advantage of the virtual world and to make it possible for our students to and uh, researchers to tap into each other's areas of expertise. And that's why we thought, like, you know, it would be a good idea to bring together um, people working on European politics, on contemporary Europe, in a new joint uh, series. This is the first one of that, of that series, but we hope to have many, many more in the future, and you will see announcements as we, as we come along. But in, in any case, I would really like to thank Professor Alistair Cole for suggesting this initiative. And um, you know, for all of us here on, in Hong Kong U, we're, we're very pleased that we could host uh, this first seminar. Now, our session tonight is dedicated to the uh, end of the Merkel era, which is seemingly around the corner. Um, Mrs. Merkel has been uh, um, basically a feature of European politics for many years now. And um, yet as she's not standing in the election, not, not standing for re-election in the upcoming federal elections in Germany in 2021. This year is coming to an end, so there's a whole bunch of question marks to um, about what will follow in, the, in its way. Now, I'm delighted to welcome our participants today. Uh, first to my left is Professor Alistair Cole. Alistair is professor and head of the Department of Government and International Studies, uh, which also houses uh, HKBU's European Studies program. Alistair was based in France before, and he's been an expert on questions of European leadership, has published extremely widely on, on uh, leadership, uh, particularly of French presidents and prime ministers. Uh, further to the left is uh, Dr. Emily Tran. Emily Tran is assistant professor and program director of European studies in the French stream at uh, the Department of Government and International Studies at HKBU. And Emily has worked on matters of relations between Europe and China, uh, French politics, and issues of migration in Europe. And further to the left is uh, uh, Dr. Nicole Cicluna. Uh, Nicole is honorary lecturer in the Department of Politics here at Hong Kong U. Nicole is an expert on EU law, constitutional developments, and European integration. And um, so she's joining us. And uh, last but not least is myself. I'm Roland Vo, uh, Associate Professor of European Studies and Head of the School of SMLC here at Hong Kong U. And um, I would just like want to say that it's like the composition of us four here is not really accidental. It is designed to be reflective, uh, reflective of our different perspectives, both in terms of the disciplines we work in and in terms of the re research we do. So, and of course, some sort of differences in cultural background as well. And that's why we ended up with a panel of women and men from politics and IR and comparative politics and European studies. And we have a Britain, a French, a German, and an Italian Maltese Australian sitting here. So what we want to do is to provide as many different perspectives as possible. So what we're gonna do, um, we're each gonna talk for about eight to 10 minutes, as sort of like this quick impulse and um, on different aspects um, of, of what the end of the Merkel era, era means for Europe, and then we'll have Q&A. For the Q&A, may I please ask you to either, for those joining us online, to use the chat function, or for those here in the room, to please switch on the microphones, because otherwise your question will not be audible to our audience online. So without further ado, we'd like to invite Professor Cole to kick off the discussion. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank, um, thanks very much to Roland for that uh, introduction, and thanks indeed for uh, inviting us here to uh, to HKU for the first of what will hopefully be a, a series of seminars uh, that, that that you very well uh, introduced. Now, I think in a sense it's interesting to be asked just to, to participate in a in a session on the end of the Merkel era. Um, she seems to have been here forever. Um, she certainly seems to have been here for most of my adult life. Uh, I remember, you know, what, what, you know, it just goes back a long time. I suppose my only real competence to speak on this topic is um, the leadership function. And also, I did uh, a long time ago. I wrote a piece on Helmut Kohl's leadership, but 
it took me a long time to write, actually, because I couldn't quite uh, fit it into my model, if you like, or my, my understanding. But, but I think, in a way, I was, I was pleased that uh, as Willie Patterson at the time sort of said, you've got to write this piece, so just carry on with it. And I was pleased, actually, that he insisted, because it, you know, it got me thinking quite, quite heavily for the first time, probably, about uh, German politics and, you know, just not being just, just thinking about France, of course, and French politics. <laughs> Um, so, so in a, in a way, that's the first uh, introduction. My, 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 my thoughts on Merkel and leadership will be of a fairly general character, actually, more about leadership than about Merkel. But of course, in a way, it goes without saying that, uh, in a sense, uh, Merkel's been the, def the, def the defining figure of the era, really. You know, the, 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 the un, un, in, in a sense, I think to, um, to understand that defining figure, we have to clearly interrogate a certain number of paradoxes. And I think the only way into this really is to, to think of leadership as a, not as a uniform type of activity, but it, what I call here is a three level game. I mean, it's a sort of, there's a three level game aspect of leadership. There's certainly three levels that we need to think about. I think when we think of leadership in general terms, we're clearly thinking about an individual level. That might be an individual style, it might be a set of beliefs, it might be a form of psychobiography, if you like. There's clearly a lot of leadership studies on that, whatever, whatever we think of them, you know, some of them are interesting. You know, the fact that Mrs. Thatcher was a grocer's daughter, did that have anything to, to say about uh, her view on life? Well, probably. Um, and I think in a sense, so at that very individual level, then clearly we, you know, we're struck by uh, the qualities of any uh, of any individual, and 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 clearly the 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 leadership background of uh, Merkel in that sense, uh, you know, to, to what extent is it is it does it signify? I think we have to we have to distinguish between I suppose personality and persona. I think persona is much more interesting politically than personality. I mean, personality in a way, you know, you can't help where you're born. Uh, not really, but persona, what, what, does, what does the individual come to represent in terms of, I suppose, role and style? What's the individual's contribution to leadership in a particular period in history and a particular setting? And I think here's much more, you know, it's interesting if we think of uh, Merkel, we think of uh, Mutti, we think of that reconciliation in a sense, that familiarity and yet that distance represented by um, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel. And so I think, in a sense, clearly, some sort of mixing up of role and style is clearly the way that I think we need to understand Merkel's leadership and, indeed, uh, uh, other, other leaderships. And I suppose, in a sense, in terms of a role, well, what role does a German chancellor play? I mean, clearly, Germany's the most important country in Europe economically. It's, it's clearly a, a country that's uh, resource-rich in many senses. It's a... It's a country with a particular set of ideas about European politics, a particular belief in perhaps auto liberalism and so on. And I, I think I would say, because obviously a country, you know, we can unfit this, but, but clearly there's a, there's a national context, if you like, that, that weighs very heavily on any German chancellor. And so I think in a way that that mix between what's the, you know, the, probably that, that happy mix, actually, for most of the period, between a particular rather shy, rather modest, rather not particularly exuberant style, and perhaps the qualities needed to succeed at the European level. You know, those, those qualities of perhaps bargaining, those qualities certainly being reasonable, those qualities of not embracing people too much. I think that's something that uh, Sarkozy didn't quite understand, but when he wanted to embrace um, uh, uh, Merkel, she was a bit horrified, actually. So I suppose, in, in a sense, the, 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 the sort of rather modest way of uh, behaving, which, which obviously distinguishes a, a tremendous, tremendous influence. And I think, in a sense, linking that influence to the, uh, I suppose, the second level of analysis, which is really the domestic setting in Germany. I won't say too much about it, because Roland will talk about this, but clearly any German chancellor uh, as far as I understand German politics, he's, he's constrained in quite a deep way domestically, more so than a French president might be, uh, certainly Macron, who uh, I won't talk about Macron at the moment, but, but clearly, I think in a sense, uh, so a German, uh, and we see this in a very, you know, the most recent set of uh, 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 events in Germany, we see how in a way, uh, you know, Merkel's seat appeared to have been, you know, deep, deeply, uh, constrained by the leaders of the lander, forced in a sense to, 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 to go, you know, to, 
to, to one, you know, the, the comment, I'm sorry, I'm not coherent here. My excuse is I had a jab yesterday. And it's getting to, I haven't quite got over it yet. No, but, uh, you know, I, this jab is sort of working its way through. But clearly, I mean, any German chancellor in the domestic setting has a sort of set of constraints, be it the federal system, the party system, the constitutional court, uh, and so on. And, this, and the whole stability culture, in a way, that perhaps is more, more weighs more heavily on freedom of action and weighs more heavily on this type of leadership that a German chancellor can actually propose. And I suppose, in a way, this is where Merkel appears to me, at least, to have been a extremely successful in the longer term, in the sense that she's managed to sit in that center of gravity of what might be both a German and a European style of leadership, and actually has managed in a way, it seems to be at least, to embody both a, a, a Europe, that's not a German Europe, but a Europe that's clearly uh, shaped by a number of principles that are there to Germany for most of them, maybe not for all of it, but maybe there's some calling into question. And I think if there were particular episodes that strike, then, you know, it was, what, we think clearly, well, uh, the, the Euro crisis, a bit later on, we think, obviously, of the, the migration issue and so on. But there are particular, the one thing I would say about now just reflecting comparison, is, I suppose if there's a turning point, really, it is that decision uh, via Schaffen, that's, you know, the 2015 uh, decision yeah. really on migration. But in a sense, whatever we think of the foundations of that, that decision, clearly, it, 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 this clearly creates a set of issues, perhaps, for Merkel, both domestically yeah. and at the European level, but it's really difficult problems to solve. So, so I think in a way, um, I'm conscious about I've got two more minutes. So I think at the third level really is broader environment. And broader environment, oh, yeah. we might say this is the external yeah, environment, it might be the world environment, it might be the European yeah. environment. Germany will always perform a, a very important, very influential role. Um, but I think it's the case also that in some respects, this external Fact, it does not always push in, 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 Germans, in Germany's favour. And I think under Merkel, clearly, there have been areas of, uh, of deep dispute with European partners over the, you know, over the Nord Stream gas pipeline, over attitude to Putin, maybe even over attitude towards China. So I think, in a sense, there are, you know, Germany clearly uh, defends its interests in a, in a hard way, in a Rhineland way, perhaps, but in a hard way. Uh, I think, in a sense, the, the, the linking of the three level or the three level metaphor, in a sense, is how does that individual contribution sit really with the broader context within the lead, leadership or the broader leadership setting? And how does that leadership setting itself help to inform the overarching sign of the times in a way? And I guess when we're saying goodbye to Mrs. Merkel, we, we, we have to acknowledge that she's been a central figure uh, in European politics for the last uh, decade and a half or so. Thank you. Uh, Emily, do you want to we follow in this order? Okay, thank you very much, Ronan, for having invited us. I'm really delighted to be here. So uh, hello to everyone on the Zoom then, and see many names, actually. Um, I, I also received my second job, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday. So in order to make myself more clear, I have prepared my uh, speech and I will uh, read it if you don't mind. So during the uh, four consecutive terms and altogether 16 years in power, German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel will have worked with no less than four French presidents. So even if the Franco-German cooperation is made up of a vast web of relations, at all levels of the political structure, the duo of the two heads of states and government actually carries a strong symbolism, embodying in itself the Franco-German relationship at large. So the quality of this relationship between the French and the German leaders is decisive also in the public opinion. When she came to power in 2005, Merkel incarnated an image of stability in Europe Whereas in France, different presidents would succeed one another. And for 16 years, Merkel was at the heart of the Franco-German couple and the engine of the European Union. Over the past 16 years, this relationship has gone through ups and downs and regularly raised the question of balancing the Franco-German relations. So I'd like to take you through a look of these four consecutive couples. And I think I have prepared an image 
that Roland is about to, uh, to show. So starting with the first Farcogen couple, Merkel and Chirac from 2005 to 2007. The Chancellor then came to power at a difficult time for Europe and for France, just after the failure, actually, of the project of a constitution for Europe, a treaty that was rejected by referendum in France. So the French president was therefore weakened by this, although he initially seemed to dominate the young chancellor coming from the East and described as shy, faced with the French president described as a grand seducteur, so seducer. However, Merkel rapidly gained posture, and in 2006, she dominated the annual Forbes list in the most powerful women in the world, a title that she would retain for 15 consecutive years. Nevertheless, the chancellor was lucky to come across a president who was already very experienced in Franco-German relations and on the European scene. So Jacques Chirac actually liked working with Germany, allowing Angela Merkel to slowly settle down in the already well-established structure of Franco-German relations. Now turning to the second couple, that is Merkel with Sarkozy 2007-2012. So more than with Jacques Chirac, who left power in 2007, Merkel especially had the opportunity to form a first Franco-German pair with Nicolas Sarkozy. Ideologically close, the two leaders, however, had little in common when it came to leadership style, as uh, mentioned by Alistair earlier on. In fact, Sarkozy has shown himself during his five-year term to be very talkative, media-oriented, even ostentatious, whereas Merkel showed discretion and sobriety. Now, Nicola Sarkozy even once said, she thinks I act. In addition, a series of misunderstandings disrupted the first meetings between the two. Per Steinbrück, then German Minister of Finance, publicly criticized Sarkozy's fiscal measures, while Sarkozy himself openly accused the German government of unilaterally withdrawing from nuclear power. But the rapprochement between Sarkozy and Merkel would take place in 2008, when Europe was hit hard by the economic and financial crisis. So from then on, between them, the discussions would be robust. Uh, Sarkozy seeking to soften the German position, who was indeed uncompromising vis-a-vis -vis the countries with the highest debt levels. Agreements would be reached, uh, but later criticized for their imperfections. The main one is the European Fiscal Pact or Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance, discussed throughout the year 2010 and approved at the year uh, in 2011, and that entered into force in 2013. After, let's look this, after the, depart, the departure of Nicola Sarkozy from the Elysee. So they have gotten to know each other, they have worked together, even under the nickname of Mercosi. So these two leaders actually came to uh, overcome their differences, their different persona, as you said, Alistair. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately for Sarkozy, this ended in oh, 2012, where he lost the election. Yeah, well. Then come the third uh, Franco-German couple, that is Merkel and François Hollande from 2012 to so the beginning of the Hollande oh, 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 and Sarkozy's successor was elected on the promise of a revision of the treaty on stability, a prospect that was totally unthinkable from Germany's point of view. Thus began a, a difficult relationship between the two rather distant ones, especially since that uh, the president, the French president and the German chancellor uh, shared different uh, ideologies, and that was a new uh, factor in the Franco-German uh, relations. So there are partisan differences. Um, and they also have uh, differences in views with regards to the Eurozone and uh, Greece. So in the summer of 2015, following a long crisis and marathon discussions and a hard fight put up by François Hollande, the French eventually obtained from Merkel a solution to avoid a Brexit, so exit from uh, Greece. Likewise, when it came to the migration crisis, cooperation between France and Germany was far from good. Paris was then extremely cautious with regard to the policy of openness chosen by Berlin. So, however, on the other issues, the two leaders showed a good capacity for collaboration. For example, in the Ukrainian crisis, Hollande and Merkel displayed a united front against Vladimir Putin to avoid an escalation of the armed conflict. This action materialized in the Minsk Agreement in 2015. 
Then, in January and November 2015, the German Chancellor also showed her strong support to Francois Hollande in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks in France. She walked alongside him in the street of Paris, and the image of her face against the president's shoulder remained one of the most striking uh, of their joint stints in power. So with successive periods of close proximity and relative distancing, the Holland merkel couple was characterized by pragmatism, discretion, regularity, and the search for compromise. So it was not a particularly spectacular relationship, but it was nonetheless a very solid one. Lastly, the couple with Merkel and Macron 2017 to uh, this year. So after a campaign of twists and turns, Macron became the head of state in May 2017, while Merkel was reappointed for a fourth term following the federal elections of September 2017. Their collaboration will end this very year when the Germans will be called to the polls, knowing that the chancellor has already indicated she would not uh, stand for re-election after 16 years in office. So Macron and Merkel actually will start very rapidly having the opportunity to meet and launch their collaboration bilaterally and in European and international events. Macron will visit Germany the day after his inauguration in office, showing clearly the importance that the Franco-German relations had in his foreign policy. Both also seem to be convinced of the need to relaunch the European project after several years of a relative immobility and the rise of Euroscepticism mm. across the continent. So faced with uh, Macron's very proactive European program, Merkel's journey was rather reserved at first. So regarding the draft budget for the Eurozone defended by the French president, Merkel supported it during the Messeberg summit in June 2018, but then revised it uh, downwards, also limiting its scope and objective. Concerning the creation of a tax on digital giants, ardently desired by France, it was actually an absolute no for Merkel. So, the relaunch of the European project under the aegis of Macron and Merkel remained modest for quite a long time. The more so as Merkel went through a time of unprecedented decline in Germany, paying the price for the historic fall of her party, the CDU, during the federal elections in 2017 oh, and regional elections in 2019. Oh, okay. Stop the fire, as we know, the chance to give up the presidency oh, oh. of the CDU and announce her departure from the chancellery at the end of her mandate. For his part, Macron also suffered from some blunders. He suffered from the um, full brunt of the Yellow Vest movement, coupled with a, a fall in popularity worsened by his mm. um, management of the pandemic, all of which hampered his ability to act and tarnish his image internationally. So in January 2019, Macron and Merkel nevertheless Meant to sign a treaty, Only in Athens, so a border town between France and Germany and the former capital of Charles Mann's empire. The objective then was indeed to give new impetus to the cooperation between the two countries in line with the 1963 Elysee Treaty. At the heart of this new text, there are international policy, security, and defense, all areas where Franco German views have increasingly come together for several years. So the situation is nevertheless upset by the recent COVID-19 pandemic, which has hit Europe hard. Merkel is praised for her good management of the crisis, whereas Macron, uh, whose party was sanctioned in the 2020 municipal election, has actually suffered a lot of criticisms. So the two leaders nevertheless managed to display a united front in the face of the economic downturn caused by the pandemic. Traditionally attached to the principle of budgetary rigor, Merkel operated an ideological and political turnaround by participating alongside Macron in the Franco-German initiative. Indeed, in May 2020, the two biggest EU countries, whose agreements usually paved the way for broader EU deals, proposed to borrow money on financial markets in the European Union's name. So the two powers jointly propose that yeah. the EU will yeah. spend 100 billion euros yeah. yeah. on the yeah. 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 and this remains the money to member states in the form of grants. So the European Council adopted the recovery plan of 750 billion euros in July 2020 after intense negotiations, and this stimulus plan is a historic deal in the EU's budgetary development. 
So faced with the economic crisis caused by the pandemic, France and Germany are therefore rediscovering their function as the driving engine behind Europe, once again, by overcoming their differences. Okay. So to conclude, mm -hmm. despite the constant mm -hmm. down, despite yeah, the different yeah, yeah, who have embodied the Franco-German couple over the years, the architecture of the Franco-German cooperation has been very stable and successful. In each difficult moment, as we have seen, regardless of the personalities and persona of the Franco-German couple, the leaders were able to find a compromise, take a step towards the other, and show themselves to be up to the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Nicole? And, uh... OK, thank you. And uh, thanks as well to, to Rowan for organizing this um, and for the invitation. So my contribution is focusing on uh, the European Union and the EU under and after Merkel. And, and what I want to do really is uh, contextualize where the European Union is uh, as Merkel prepares to depart the political scene and how Merkel's leadership, how Germany's leadership uh, shaped that, shaped the position in which the EU finds itself. So uh, as has already been pointed out, Merkel has been Chancellor for nearly 16 years. And if I were to summarise it in a, in a nutshell, I would say that she leaves an EU that is battered by several crises, which, which I'll touch on, um, but resilient. Uh, as has already been mentioned as well, so she's been German Chancellor since November 2005, which makes her the EU's longest serving leader. Um, and again, by way of context, so where was the EU uh, in, in, in late 2005 when Merkel first became Chancellor? Uh, as Emily already mentioned, it was shortly after the abandonment of the Constitutional Treaty, um, after uh, negative referenda results in France and the Netherlands. It was also about a year or so after the Big Bang enlargement, so the enlargement of the European Union to uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, as well as Malta and Cyprus. So it was, a, it was a moment, I suppose, of identity searching. I wouldn't quite say identity crisis, but identity searching, right, with both the enlargement and then the failure of the attempt to explicitly constitutionalise the European Union. Following that, uh, and much more significantly, Merkel then presided over Germany throughout uh, what I would call the EU's crisis decade, uh, 2010 to 2020. Um, and again, to, to pick up on the term that Alistair used, persona, uh, I think in many ways Merkel, and we, I agree, so Merkel is a defining figure, um, and in many ways uh, she personified, um, I would say, the EU's crisis management style. Um, and also personified or, or has embodied um, many of the contradictions and many of the tensions uh, that the EU has faced and, and continues to face. Um, and I'll come back to that point. I'll come back to what I mean about embodying or personifying uh, the EU's crisis management style. So coming forward to, to the present, uh, and, and Merkel is preparing to, to leave, so yes, yeah, she's not contesting the next elections. Uh, she will be leaving office at a time when the many crises that the EU has faced over the past decade are being or, or have been managed, right? so it's definitely crisis management, um, have been managed, but none have really been decisively resolved. Uh, and, and, and what are the crises or what are the challenges that I'm talking about? Well, many of them, uh, Alistair and Emily have already uh, discussed or touched on. So firstly, uh, the euro crisis, which I would say began in earnest in early 2010 when, when the extent of Greece's uh, indebtedness, public indebtedness became clear. Uh, but which soon obviously spread from being primarily uh, a Greek debt crisis to a much more existential challenge for the Eurozone as a whole and, and, and revealing some pretty serious, uh, well, issues with the, the, the structure of the Eurozone and its institutional framework that were already known, but, but became much clearer. Also, as it's being mentioned, the migration crisis, uh, which in turn, I would say, is really, again, it's, it's more than a migration crisis. It's a crisis of the EU's institutional capacity, uh, a crisis of its humanitarian values. Um, and a crisis of inter, interstate solidarity, solidarity amongst the EU member states. And that crisis played out most dramatically from, from mid-2015 and into 2016. But again, uh, the problems it, it revealed have never really properly, deeply been addressed. And Emily referred to the differences there. So France was not uh, so keen on Merkel's open door policy. Uh, later, when some member states, uh, Germany, Austria, Sweden, traditionally high recipients of asylum applications, wanted to push for permanent refugee quotas, uh, France's position on that was somewhat ambiguous and, again, not, not necessarily strongly keen on, on those kinds of initiatives. Uh, so the migration crisis. 
Also, again, as been uh, mentioned, the crisis of EU-Russia relations, right, especially obviously post the 2014 annexation of Crimea and, and then with more, much more recent low points, uh, such as the poisoning of, of Navalny. Uh, another one I would touch on, um, and because again, I think Merkel and Germany's role in all of these has been really central, uh, the crisis of so-called democratic backsliding, which is mostly associated with, with Hungary and Poland, which again is more than about those two member states. It's a challenge to the EU's internal cohesiveness. It, it raises questions of what the EU is, what it, what it wants to be, what it can be, uh, its ability to, to protect and project its values. And now, of course, the, the COVID crisis, which has both a public health dimension and also an economic dimension. And, and that economic dimension, again, brings up issues that were left unresolved from the Euro crisis, including about the mutualization of debt. Uh, and, and whether some sort of system of permanent transfers among member states should or could be set up. Um, and there again, actually, as uh, Emily mentioned, there has been a significant, uh, the Franco-German tandem uh, was really important in getting agreement on the 750 billion euro fund, the next generation EU fund, which was negotiated uh, last year and, and, and agreement reached roughly mid last year. Although I think um, that agreement was then I mean, and the scale of the fund was somewhat predicated on Europeans thinking then that the worst of the public health dimension of the crisis was over, which it clearly is not. So you know, whether that fund will now be enough um, is another question. So those are all the crises or challenges the EU faces, uh, continues to face. And so what do I mean about the crisis management style and, and how Merkel personified it? And here again, I think it should be emphasised what's already been said, that Germany, of course, is the EU's preeminent power. And in fact, that status has been cemented uh, as a result of the crisis decade and throughout the crisis decade, right? So Germany's centrality is uh, the, the Eurozone's biggest and most powerful economy to the Euro crisis, or as the most attractive state for uh, asylum seekers and migrants to uh, attempt to reach the migration crisis uh, and so on. So therefore leadership was expected of Merkel, uh, whether or not she was willing or, or uh, wanting to provide that level of leadership. Okay, so coming to the EU's crisis management style, well, it's, it's being described variously by scholars as muddling through, right, a muddling through approach, uh, which, which means basically finding mostly lowest common denominator type solutions and solutions that, again, are not, not long-term resolutions of the problems, but in many ways just doing enough to get through right, until, until the next crisis while avoiding major reform. Um, and the desire to avoid major reform, of course, is to do with the EU's legal and constitutional system and the extreme difficulty of performing the treaties, which I won't get into. Um, also, uh, the, the term failing forward has been used uh, by Eric Jones, um, Dan Kellerman, and, and Sophie Moynier, right? And this is the idea that the EU fails forward by striking incomplete bargains in the first place, uh, and those incomplete bargains, such as having a single currency without a proper fiscal union. Um, they precipitate crises, which then require further integration. So it's an optimistic take on crisis as opportunity, right? That crisis is built into the integration model. So in facing major challenges, both Merkel uh, and the EU more generally have tended to adopt a, a pragmatic, but arguably, at least at times, unprincipled uh, piecemeal approach, right? So Merkel is famously a, a leader without a vision, right? And she's not... Um, yet yeah, maybe necessarily as communicative as, as, as some other leaders or has a different persona or different style. And so she has then in many ways personified the entire EU approach, right, which is piecemeal, um, lacking in a grand vision, uh, and characterised at times by major policy U-turns and seemingly contradictory stances. So, you know, early on with the Euro crisis, when, when again, the extent of Greek debt was revealed, um, uh, Merkel was insisting that Greece would not get a bailout, and then you know Greece got three bailouts in, in five in the space of five years or so. Or uh, the migration crisis. So in August 2015, uh, Germany unilaterally suspended the Dublin regulation, so allowing so the open borders policy specifically for Syrian refugees, or obviously how that could be enforced, allowing them to come from Hungary uh, to. Germany, um, obviously Hungary and Germany don't share a border, so that means going through Austria. So, you know, it had significant implications um, for a number of other member states as well. But so that unilateral suspension, that open border policy, then followed later by the reimposition of border controls, the suspension of the Schengen area of free movement, 
uh, as well as the negotiation of the EU-Turkey statement, which Merkel really was the driving force behind that. Um, and that greatly uh, reduced refugee flows, right? Getting Turkey to take more responsibility for preventing refugees coming from Turkey to, to Greece and further into Europe. Um, or in terms of contradictory stances, you know, take the position towards Russia, okay? So strong criticism on human rights issues, strong criticism over the Navalny poisoning. I mean, Germany saved Navalny, right? Um, combined with undented support for Nord Stream 2. Um, so I'll come to my conclusion then, because I, I think my time is almost up. Um, what next then for the EU after Merkel, as, as Merkel departs? Um, again, uh, so many crises unresolved, and I think at the heart of it all, um, an identity crisis that may well be worsened somewhat by the loss of Merkel, who has been a steady influence, um, and even more so, you know, experts on France would you know better how likely this is, but were Marine Le Pen to win the French presidency, probably not that likely. Um, but so this is the identity crisis that the EU faces, and in some ways it's faced the whole time, right? Uh, what is the EU? What does it stand for? Uh, can it transcend this piecemeal pragmatism in favour of, of what I think what is much needed to make reform? Um, and again, Merkel was not a visionary leader, but I suppose the question then is, uh, does the EU need a vision and, and what should it be? Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so I will try to, in contrast to the other uh, speakers, I will just try to briefly delve in a little bit more into uh, German domestic politics uh, to cover also that angle. And I want to focus on the achievement and transformations that occurred during the Merkel era, some of the problems, and then maybe finish off in a few words about their her, her likely or possible successes. Now, I completely agree with uh, Alistair and and uh, Emily and um, and Nicole that is like that as a persona, Merkel has been a very strange and unique kind of uh, person. She's like she will be Germany's longest serving chancellor. She's by far still at this moment the most popular politician, which is kind of surprising given that she's not particularly charismatic or she's not a very riveting speaker. She's outlet for US presidents, four French presidents, five British prime ministers, eight Italian PMs. So it's like she's been there for a couple of, you know, she's been around doing this business for a long time, which is kind of strange because she now finds herself in the company of the Putins and the Erdogans who've seemingly been there forever, um, which is sort of like a strange. She's also like, you know, she's East German, a divorced woman with no kids. A scientist with, if you think about it, is a very unusual background for a CDU politician. There aren't many people like this in her party. But there was her who rose through the ranks. It's kind of remarkable in and of itself. Uh, for the longest period of time in the 1990s, she was a nobody. Nobody had an eye on her. Even when she was elected as chancellor, I remember this, like people couldn't believe it, that she would be suddenly become chancellor and not only one that would be there for 16 years later. So... She's been continuously underestimated. And um, she has, I don't think this is always by, this is not always accidental. So she's also used this a little bit for her own political career. So she's a very transactional leader, very methodical, and extremely deadly. There's this joke in Berlin where they say that behind the chancellor, there's like this cemetery where all these men lie whose political careers have been ended by Miss Merkel. And uh, so there's, uh, there's Mr. Wolf and Mr. McAllister and Friedrich Merz and Ursula von der Leyen and Seehofer. And this, the German politics full of these names whose careers were stunted because they got into contact with Ms. Merkel and rubbed it the wrong way. They were demoted somewhere else. So it is kind of remarkable that another sign of her, of her you know, like success, arguably, has been that, as far as I can tell, she's the only German chancellor who actually created new words. So there's the famous, like if you talk of verbs, is Ausmerkeln. <laughs> Ausmerkeln is now a verb that is like you could probably find in the Duden by now, which is like, which basically means to sit out or to do nothing. You know, so if you like to say Ausmerkeln. But there's also other words. Alice already mentioned one of them, Mutti. Mm. Mutti is sort of like the endearing word for mother. And um, she hated that nickname at first until they realized that it actually works really well with voters and uh, because it suggests that you're close to them. Now, if you look at Ms. Merkel, her whole mannerism is like she's not very close at all to people. She feels very awkward in public situations. 
She feels very, she, she does not like to touch people or kiss babies or give hugs or things like that that you normally do on the campaign trail. So another two words that are striking me that are slightly more problematic is one is this alternative laws. Under her government, this word came up, uh, this adjective came up a number of times, basically it means without alternative, which is very strange that she created this culture of consensus that is so suffocating that it sits very oddly with what a pluralist democracy actually is about. That there's no comfort, very little confrontational debate, very little appetite for confrontational debate. And the last one is Meinungskorridor, which basically means this kind of tunnel of acceptable political opinions and propositions, which people feel has narrowed under her government. That there's either like that this is the only, you know, so this is sort of these are the acceptable propositions, and everything else is sort of out of bounds. Is not socially okay anymore. Now her achievements are actually quite long. So she obviously has had dramatic political staying power. She won four consecutive federal elections. The CDU, which is strange, you know, like has ruled Germany since 1982, has governed with, since 1982 with only one interruption between 1998 and 2005, you know, which is like remarkably long for one political party to be in, in power. She has, you know, she oversaw a huge rise in the German economy and a massive creation of employment, which is actually very, very, the statistics lie here because Germany's employment creation is even higher because the labor force participation rate is at its max. It is way above OECD average. And you could say that before 2014, Germany was probably the best governed country in the world. It was of the major economies, the major powers in the world, Germany is probably the best governed one. It had very low political problems, very low levels of political polarization. It has, was rich, it was peaceful, it was non-threatening, it had plentiful jobs, it had low debt, whatever you want. Since then, the perception has changed dramatically. Many Germans felt that that was the high point and since Germany has become stuck. So some of the transformations that she obviously has induced, one of them, I think, personally, quite openly, is that she has turned or, um, uh, or facilitated the turn of Germany to become, to see itself and identify itself as an immigration country. Before there was always allowed a big majority against immigration, even though immigration happened, but people were in denial and allowed minority for it. Now it's the other way around. And Germany now finds itself in the company of countries like Australia and Canada and a few others who sort of see themselves as an immigration. The other big transformation is to the CDU as a party. So the CDU's recipe for success after World War II was that it became, it morphed from a Catholic party to a trans-confessional party that would also include Protestants. Now, under her government, religion and Christianity have been thrown out altogether. So what does the C actually stand for in the CDU? It has no meaning. So this is obviously a problem for a spectrum of conservative groups. So she has overseen this kind of social democratization of the CDU, which means the CDU has embraced a much more statist and a tax and spend attitude towards many problems in society than it has ever done before. Um, and also interestingly, it's been a big transformation in foreign and security policy, which is actually something she really enjoys doing. But here I think the problem has been like she has paid a lot of lip service that is popular to the EU, to the transatlantic alliance, to multilateralism or something like that, but has backed it up with little. If you look at German foreign policy, it looks like there's Außenwirtschaftspolitik, there's foreign commercial policy. That's what Germany really has something going for itself, but there's very little else. Um, she's also, her, Germany's current posture is kind of like, it's kind of friendly to rivals and kind of distant to friends, which mm. is awkward and sits awkward. The deeds of German foreign and security policy sit awkwardly with the rhetoric. And then there's one thing about the CDU that, that I need to mention here. So, under her, she's won four elections, but this should not paper over. The CDU has been bleeding millions and millions of votes. In 1990, when the first German election, you know, after reunification happened, the CDU got 20 million votes. Now they're down to 15. If the current polls stand, they'll be down to somewhere between 10 and 11. So in 2017, last election, they got 15.3 million votes. You know, now they will, they'll be lucky if they get 10 to 12 million. You know, so where does where do all these voters go and why are they not voting for the CDU? You see they also like major strongholds of the CDU, like Baden-Württemberg and Rheinland-Pfalz and Thuringia, something has been lost. You know? 
So let me just spend uh, one little word on some problems. To me, there's like three, three main problems. The first one is Germany's isolation in the EU. Um, under her government, there's basically no major initiative has taken place on, on the EU. Everything was dreamt up in France and Brussels and Italy, somewhere else, but it never came from Berlin. The second one is, and it's true, so it's like she has okayed this joint borrowing thing scheme mm -hmm. with the French, which I think will be one of her big European legacies, but that's about it. The interesting thing is also Germany cannot get majorities in the EU for what it actually wants. So for all the propositions that it does have, which are very few, it cannot get a majority, cannot get other EU countries to back that. And it has sort of done this kind of go it alone attitude, which means on energy, from one day to the other, they decided to switch off nuclear energy without consulting the European neighbors. From one of the day to the others, they decided to disregard the Dublin rules and take refugees in without consulting the European neighbors. And on Russia, as you've already mentioned, you know, Germany plays an awkward role. There. The other big thing is the neglect of security and defense. The state of the military and the intelligence service link, services in Germany has become shambolic. It's an absolute disaster, um, which is worrying because Germany has now become an obstacle to European security integration and to the European security architecture. Um, and this was, I kind of think of one closer, uh, like worse episode than when Hollande in early 2014 begged the Germans, okay, we're about to invade, we're both to, to basically have a military operation in Mali because we want to prevent Mali from becoming a second Somalia on Europe's doorstep. And the Germans said, sorry, we're busy washing our hair. So, you know, they did not take this up. So this is, this is a, this is, I think, is a, is a, well, it was a monumental mistake. And the last thing is that it's like there's the opportunism of the political class. So she has campaigned very often, very often on propositions that she later did the opposite when she was, you know, after the election. So she campaigned on no tax cuts and then had the biggest rise in VAT, which is the biggest tax rise ever. She campaigned not to introduce a minimum wage, and then there was a minimum wage. She, she uh, wanted to keep nuclear energy and then got rid of nuclear. She wanted to keep conscription and then scrap. And then she wanted, she said in 2011 that multiculturalism failed. And then four years later, she said, like, hey, we have open borders and uncontrolled migration. So I think this has spawned a kind of cynicism in Germany, which is not helpful. And in particular, the security services. So I would, I've heard this throughout my own research over and over and over again. The people who are experts in this field, they say, watch out. The police officers and the soldiers are no longer voting CDU. They're starting to vote AFD, and we have to, you know, that, that will become a problem. And um, so let me just, so what I think about the successors, there's four people to watch. There's Armin Laschet, the premier of North Westphalia, Markus Söder, the premier of Bavaria, and then Annalena, Annalena Baerbock and Robert Habeck, the two green leaders, and one of them will be chosen. So I think one of these four people will be the Greens will decide on April 19th, so next Monday you'll know. With the CDU, we don't know what they're going to come up with. They're all very uninspiring people. I think like the most, <laughs> the most, the person to watch will be Annalena Baerbock. I think she's like Merkel. She's underestimated. She's very well educated. She's the only one who's been educated overseas. Um, she was, she did her master's in SOAS and international relations and things like that. So she actually understands that Robert Habeck is basically like a, a sort of philosophy background. Armin Laschet has been in the business forever. Um, so, so I think like Annalena Baerbock actually stands a very good chance of being either the kingmaker in the next government, or maybe, you know, if the polls go her way, being leading a government herself. So, but for all four people, I foresee one problem. And that is, they all have lots of good intentions, but they're unaware of, under, of the unintended consequences of Germany's behavior in Europe and elsewhere. And they've all sort of part of this political class that have become very inward looking. It is very obsessed with German problems and German coalition things and German things, but it's not, it's not really thinking about what happens in Europe, what happens beyond the borders of, of, of Europe. And that's something that Germany actually needs to play a role. So I should leave it here. Um, we all look forward to your comments and suggestions. May I please remind people to uh, use the microphone if you're asking questions here. And for those of you online, you can put uh, questions in the chat or you just turn on your, your camera and your um, and microphone so we can hear it here. I already have a question over there, James. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, my name is James Fisher. I'm from the European Studies program here. 
Um, I Can you talk closer your, to the microphone? I enjoy all of your talks, but I have a question and challenge for everyone but Roland. Uh, Roland <laughs> talked about Angela Merkel. The other three of you didn't. You really talked about the chancellorship of Germany. You talked about structural issues. You talked about the Franco uh, German relationship. But it made me wonder if the leader of the Green Party or the SDG or a different CDU leader were in charge, how many of the things any of you talked about would really be different? For me, the obvious one is the 2015 migration. That was really Merkel's personal decision. And in that case, you know, France tried to save her from herself and failed. Uh, but most of the time, I hear a story of Germany having structural relations with the rest of the EU that are a structural policy question of Germany's relationship with the EU, a structural policy question of the federal government's relationship with the states and how that's affected COVID policy. Would that really be different with an SDP leader? I don't think so. A structural relationship with France in the EU. If this is the case, is she not irrelevant? Has she made maybe one or two major decisions of significance? Anyone else would have been more or less the same. France seems unstable. This is foolish. France is a successful democratic state, which has turned over various, uh, which had, through its stability, been able to change leaders and have different tax, different leaders with different tax, but maintained a stable political system that has successfully proceeded forward. That seems to be a demonstration of success. Whereas Merkel, as Roland is suggesting, in fact, has a lot of potential failures in basically not allowing concerns and problems to be expressed through the political system and going through an EU model. Well, you know, the EU model is to be any bureaucrat to be in charge of Germany. What so makes her relevant and not just the answer? Shall we collect a few questions first and then maybe we can, yeah? Is that um, anybody else? So I have a question here on the chat. Do you think it was the right decision in 2015 to let such a huge, devastating amount of refugees flood into the country? Um, and let's take one more question. Uh, okay, I'll take James's questions later because it actually comes in two. In two um, let's, let's take that later. So maybe refugees and does Merkel make a difference? Who wants to go first? I think in terms of, I mean, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good set of comments. I mean, in, in a sense, I think that's really what I was, uh, you know, when I was talking about the particular leadership setting of a German chancellor, I mean, I was specifically actually not trying to sort of drill down too much to the individual level of, of Angela Merkel. And I think actually it, it is interesting because, I mean, in a way, uh, you know, would 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 another German chancellor have acted in a different way? Well, let's say it's a counterfactual. We, we don't know, of course. But but in a way, you know, we, we we I think we would have to say, well, I mean, there are there are there are, you know, leadership's always structured. You know, the, 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 there's always a, a setting that doesn't you know, it, it's not it, it's not a deterministic. You know, you have to be very careful about any deterministic sorts of arguments. Of course, we do. But clearly, leaderships are are, are structured in particular settings. So I think. Um, and I think, in a way, maybe Merkel's success is a failure. You know, I mean, in a way, the things that you were talking about, Roland. I mean, the, 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 those are clearly, you know, uh, the inability to grasp what are perhaps the really big questions, the big questions of the of the of, the, of society, and the big questions of the decade. That they, they are perhaps questions that were not grasped by Merkel. But on the other hand, that was possibly the the, the counterpart to her 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 muddling through sort of style that was appropriate for the circumstances. I mean, it, it's not a particularly good answer, but in a way, I think it's a difficult question to actually answer empirically, given the, the sense that we don't know what another leader would have done. In relation to the uh, immigration question, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I think in a sense, that was maybe one decision that did take a certain courage, you know, and I think, I suppose that's the one decision where there was some sort of Real legitimizing discourse, you know, uh, the legitimizing discourse being, well, we are, a, we are, a, we are a civilized country. We are a space for a country for refugees. We do want to see an end to human suffering. So I suppose, yeah, I mean, I, I'd probably take the the different view than the question there. I mean, you, you could say, well, in that particular case, you know, uh, and I absolutely agree with what Nicole was saying in terms of how that decision was very much personalized in a way, particularly the, the agreement with Turkey and so on. But I think, in a way, that, that that's. That, 
maybe the counterpart to uh, to the more general picture that's emerging. <clears throat> I was going to say, I think the, I think the microphone, please. Yeah, I think the three of you are not trying to disagree as much as the challenge you bring on your public point stronger. Um, and I think the reason is there's a tonal difference. You all sounded like you were eulogizing Queen Elizabeth, she, she <laughs> marks an era, and not Margaret Thatcher, for better or worse, she transformed the country, right? And it is in the 2015 decision, that's the one, the immigration decision, that's the one where you immediately go for, and she transformed Germany. That's a, that shows her leadership and her impact, I think, in a way that none of us did. They had not nuclear policy. Any other comments on the the questions so far? Yeah, yeah Nicole, please. Um, okay, so yeah, what would be different with a different leader? It is it is a difficult question. Um, so, of course, in some ways, it's hard to say. But I would I would go back to the Euro crisis um, and and Merkel's role early in the Euro crisis. So. Her, firstly, Greece won't get a bailout, which was changed to, okay, Greece will get a bailout. But but the narrative was set fairly early of this kind of debt and guilt rhetoric. Um, and so, you know, very much coming with strings attached. Um, how different would that have been with a different leader? It depends whether it would be a different CDU leader or SPD. But SPD was, I, my understanding is, was more open to less austerity-focused solutions. Um, an SPD leader might have been able to work better with Francois Hollande's uh, presidency in terms of um, coming up with, with, with a different... So I think the Euro crisis response could have could potentially have been very different because the narrative was said early on that, you know, this is a, a, a crisis caused by irresponsible borrowing, irresponsible fiscal policies of Greece and others. And that narrative, which, which like research since then has shown that that's far from the accurate or whole story, right? So that narrative could have been very different and it could have been more like, well, this is a... This is about structural problems and, and the way to go is more about debt forgiveness and you know the, the start of a transfer union rather than austerity and bailouts, you know, focused on loans that actually, you know, don't actually improve Greece's debt situation and so on. So, so I would probably point to that. Um, on the open borders question, was it a good decision? I mean, it was it was an extremely difficult decision in extremely difficult circumstances. Um, and my criticism in my presentation was more about, I guess, yeah, the, the one day to the next nature of it and the lack of consultation with neighbouring countries and with the EU since they were impacted by it. Um, but, you know, I mean, that crisis was, a, was in, in many ways a failure of the EU, right, because there should have been uh, more of a coherent EU-wide response. It, it, in some ways, it shouldn't have been for Merkel and for Germany um, to make this decision to, to open borders. So... Um, yeah, the journey wasn't an extremely difficult position. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you for your question, James. Uh, I'm not quite sure because your uh, comment was to say that Merkel was uh, unspectacular and uh, stable uh, compared to a uh, much flamboyant uh, French president, but their flamboyancy and uh, change of presidency portray something of the workings of the democratic system. Um, but at the same time, some people were, could be tired of this uh, flamboyant French president, and they were flamboyant in very different styles. You know, Holland has his mistresses, uh, Sarkozy has also his uh, uh, wives, uh, Macron is also very proactive. So uh, to certain to certain Jupiter. point of view, yes, Jupiterian uh, president, as uh, Alistair put it in his book, so to to certain extent, you know, the idea of a flamboyant, uh, charismatic president uh, is tiresome, and somehow stability is uh, not something that is uh, that's uh, bad. So being pragmatic and discreet, and uh, so that that's uh, my uh, comment on this. On the question of the refugees, actually, you know, yes. So everything has been uh, said on this, and it has had. Uh, teaching in the European Studies program as you uh, are teaching. From the outside perspective, it has made Europe gain a lot of points uh, because it was a huge crisis and the youth today are very much concerned about this. And when they saw Germany accepting into Germany so many one million refugees, it, it made Europe, not only Germany, uh, go high. So it was a huge soft power tool. So I think looking from the outside, the refugee uh, perspective is slightly different despite all the problems I created in Europe. I think with, with, with the issue of the 
change your current president, what I need to point out is simply that despite significant change in the leadership of one of the two countries in this partnership, the relationship model one structurally necessary. If they find a way, no matter which party the French president is from, no matter which party the, the German chancellor is from, they need to find a way they do and they get forward. And so if that's the case, then who cares? As long as it's not the AFD president or chancellor of Germany, in which case or Le Pen or something, right? Other than that, they pretty much when it was Mitterrand, there was a, a relationship and it went forward. So is it not therefore irrelevant who's actually chancellor if it's always going to be a relationship anyway? I think I think like one one episode or one particular theme where I think Ms. Merkel's handling of it was very different from her predecessors was that particularly in the CDU is that I think her predecessors, particularly Kohl, Genscher, Brandt, Schmidt, all these people would not have let uh, the relationship with Poland to deteriorate to the point that it has. And I think this has been a blind spot of, of Ms. Merkel. She has been hoodwinked by the business deals with Russia and forgetting that Poland is a big and significant and much more commercially important neighbor than Russia. And Russia plays a very destructive role for the EU in general. And um, so I think like all other, other CDU predecessors, particularly who were involved in foreign security policy would have had a much more watchful eye then on the relationship with Poland particularly given history. And um, so I think like this is something that does strike me as something, yeah, it's like where she was, you know, where she did not pay enough attention to. Stefan? I, I would just like to uh, thank you all for, for brilliant contributions, but I would like to expand on Lauren's uh, last point and also related, related to your point about the possible successor. That, and the reputation of Merkel outside of Germany is really disproportionately positive to her legacy, precisely in that respect, in respect to Germany's global influence. And the problem that we identified for all the potential successes can be also seen in Merkel's action, that she seems unaware of Germany's preponderance and just how important Germany's decisions are on the rest of Europe and the wider world. And that goes to every single decision that she took without consultation with the refugee crisis. She didn't even consult the coalition partner, let alone uh, France and, and, and other uh, countries, right? Uh, with the Eurozone crisis that, that, that the Sikona uh, uh, discussed uh, and how badly uh, was mishandled. I mean, that led to the overreaction during the refugee crisis that was presently happening. The refugee crisis, in turn, made Brexit almost certain. Uh, possible, right? It was a hugely influential factor. On, Although that's on empirically Brexit. hard to prove. Sorry? Although that is empirically hard to prove. Yes, yes, of <laughs> course, of course. Uh, and, and then the relationship with, with Russia and, and uh, uh, with China, where Merkel seems to be captured by the business interests and disregarding uh, the transatlantic alliance, the US interest in relation to China and, and Russia. So her reputation as the leader of the Western world is completely at odds with the legacy uh, that she leaves, uh, where Germany uh, behaved like, like uh, well, not like a, a staunch uh, ally uh, kind of, of the Western world. Can, can we, um, in the interest of time, would like to go to a few, take a few questions from the uh, chat also, and then we can just sort of pick another round of, of answers, if that's all right. There's a question by, James, who is asking to all panelists, what do you think would a post-Merkel EU look like? Would it be more intergovernmentalist or more federalist? Um, does it depend on who wins at the CDU or what kind of governing coalition is there in Europe? There's a question to me. How do you think Chancellor Merkel will go down in the political history books? So I will take that one. Maybe you can, and then maybe we can have one more. COVID triggered reinstating national borders to levels not seen in decades. Will the notion of the United States of Europe ever reinstate after this? So I think like we have maybe these kind of questions are combined a little bit like EU, what will it look like? Um, does it depend on who's in power in Germany? Then I'll take the one on, on the, um, the history books. 
wants to go first. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but I think uh, thanks, James, for your for your very uh, pertinent questions. And I think, in a way, what's interesting here is to see, you know, come back to Merkel's leadership from 2005 uh, up until the present, and, and to say, in a way, the, the answer to your question is perhaps in the, the evolving nature of that leadership. And when we look at the very end of the Merkel period, we clearly do see, you know, I mean, in reactions to the COVID crisis, I mean, the, the, the classic German policy position, which I described before as sort of order liberal in a sense, was, was not the one that was finally adopted by the European Commission. I mean, the, the 750, you know, I mean, it's it's reversing the saints and sinners metaphor in a way. You know, the, the, the sinners, in a way, I mean, the, the European Union going to, uh, you know, direct onto the uh, financial markets to borrowing, you know, borrowing is a simple thing to do in a way in this in this logic, but going on. And in a sense, I think that's maybe that's been um, a critical juncture, arguably. You know the fact that the that the the European Union is going to be essentially borrowing uh, so much money over such a long period, and who's going to, you know, uh, what, what what will the implications feed through for the future nature of uh, of European fiscal policy and so on? I think in a way, you know, and, and those un, unresolved questions about the euro are not going to be far behind, really. You know, um, I, I, I think in a sense, you know, do you have that, you know, what? what <clears throat> What, what will the uh, implications be for the long-term uh, security survival of the, of the currency? You know, is, is it still too much of a halfway house? You know, does it still not actually require probably much more bolder forms of uh, mutual uh, mutualization of debts and so on and fiscal transfers? You know, and in a sense, those things are going against, in a way, perhaps arguably that classic German view. But I think so. I think maybe actually the end of the Merkel period might actually be the one that signifies a to, to, to use the option, perhaps a, a leap into a um, more, more federalist type of arrangement, if only because you know, the currency is so important here. On the other hand, the whole thing might explode, which is, which is another way of looking at it. Um, so that, 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 that's my answer to, to, to your question, James. <laughs> Yes, I, um, I can take uh, James' uh, question. Um, we have mentioned a lot of uh, internal EU and national level uh, factors. I would like to add that the future of the EU is also, and the end of the Merkel era coincides with uh, also a shifting world order. We have not talked about uh, the uh, rising uh, rivalry of uh, great powers and uh, China coming to the EU. So I think we, we have to take into account uh, these external factors. But of course, in the past, uh, it has been proven that uh, whenever there was a crisis, at least for the Franco-German couple, uh, despite the different presidencies, there, has been, uh, there have been able to overcome the uh, differences and to come to an understanding and to come out, try to come out stronger. So let's see, and I'm quite confident that uh, in, in the future, even in this shift in world order, uh, the EU might, faced with external factors, find a way uh, to continue together in one form or another, more for the realism or not. Um, I'll just add briefly, and maybe in contrast to Alistair, I think that, um, that the EU uh, is not likely to become more federalist in the post merkel era. Uh, it won't necessarily become more intergovernmentalist, but I think it has become more intergovernmentalist and, and will probably continue in that vein. Um, and that's where perhaps, yeah, it doesn't necessarily uh, make a huge difference who the next chancellor is because it also depends on so many other things. And that, and then fundamentally any major reform requires unanimous, unanimous support um, in the European Union and that's unlikely to be found. So yeah, of course the EU's future depends partly on, on who the next chancellor is and, and how pro-European they are, but it depends on other national election results. Um, but I just think what we've seen over the past decade is that there are so many fundamental differences. So that's why it's been so difficult to get um, to get a unified response on migration or a unified response on the euro. Uh, the next generation EU fund is potentially a game changer, but you know, even there, so this, this idea that the commission is gonna borrow the money, so the commission is gonna raise debt, and then that debt is gonna be paid back with, with EU own resources. So that requires the own resources decision to be ratified in each member state. And so far it's been ratified in about half of member states and it's subject to a legal challenge in Germany. So, of course, Merkel's not the only person in Germany who's been, you know, focused on austerity and reluctant to create a transfer union. Um, every single step of the Euro crisis response has been subject to, to legal challenge in Germany. 
uh, you know, so, so that needs to be resolved. Um, so I think, yeah, this next generation EU, it, it could be the kernel of something, right? But but that's that's not yet clear. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'd like to um, thank Nicole. I would like to go to a question that I got here from James. How do you think Angela Merkel will go down in the history books? And I also got another question about like from Elizabeth that said Russia is generally you said that Russia generally plays a destructive role in the EU. Can you elaborate? So I want to just do that very quickly. Um, I think in the in hindsight, the assessment of the Merkel era will become a little bit like Tony Blair's Britain. It's like it sounded nice at the time, but when you look 10 years, 15 years later, you think like what, what actually happened there? You know, there's very few things where you can sort of say like, okay, time went by and it was like, it was sort of like a positive, I don't know, like, you know, good, how warm feelings, perceptions, but I don't know, if you sort of look at concrete things that actually took place, very little. I think already it is showing that in Germany, there's this perception that like all the other European countries are somehow laggards. They're not doing the homework correctly, but people are sometimes seemingly unaware that other European countries, sometimes also because of fiscal pressure, have actually changed quite a lot and Germany hasn't. And now with this COVID thing, for instance, you can see it's like Greece has this new digital way of organizing vaccines, much more effective than, than the shambolic thing that is going on in Germany. You know, so they're sort of leapfrogged them. The second question here is about um, uh, the Russia. I think like this was, I, what I mean here by Russia playing a destructive role is because unlike other external partners like the US or China, US and China have always favored closer integration of Europe. Russia wants the opposite. Russia wants to disintegrate Europe and it wants to sort of split that club. And in that thing, I think it is destructive. And it's interesting to, to, to just reflect for one second um, on Merkel's persona here, because Merkel actually speaks Russian. So she spoke Russian long before she spoke English. And Putin speaks German. So they, these guys can communicate in a way that is like they can't, she doesn't really do with other leaders. In fact, she was sort of late to learn English and to give speeches in English and things like that. So it's sort of, you know, she developed that skill as she sort of went along. But uh, there's obviously some sort of special way about how she handles Russia. And I think it sits at odd how other European countries want to conduct the relationship with Russia. So, but nonetheless, I think like the, 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 the Russian is, uh, policy is a challenge to the EU. Can we maybe have one last question or comment? Andrew and Martin, can you combine very brief? Sure. Uh, I just have a question for everyone about Merkel's leadership style. Roland mentioned this idea um, there's kind of no alternative. This was a famous Thatcherite slogan as well, I think. If I wonder if you could compare maybe this, these dominating female figures in politics, what similarities or, or differences might there be between the two? Martin? Um, just want to respond to that. Um, Maybe a question Can you about, talk closer uh, to the microphone? Yeah, sure. I uh, just want to also uh, get on to that um, question about how macro will really, be uh, remembered in, in history books. I think it's, it's an extremely important question about the legacy of her. And I think it's it's invariably going to go to that single faithful decision she made in 2015 that uh, many of you have referred to already. Um, and, and, and on that point, I, I'm not very sure if, if I, I would agree with Roland that, you know, under uh, the time, the, the CDU, the C in the CDU has disappeared or, or has decreased in meaning, because I think invariably it is going to be interpreted in concretion terms, you know, how that decision was made, was it because she had this TV interview with a little girl at some point before that really changed her stance uh, drastically. Um, and I myself remember very well um, the, 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 the phrase that she used at that time very uh, often when talking about the Flüchtlinge or the uh, refugee problem, which is for um, unsere house tür, you know, before our, the, the door of our house, this problem is happening. This is very closely related to this Christian image of, you know, this poor guy in front of our door. If we don't do anything, you know, we are, we are sinful. I think. Um, what I really want to say is that I, I think that the, the C has actually increased in meaning under her uh, in terms of perception rather than de decreasing, especially at a time when the Catholic Church is doing terribly with the, with the uh, uh, people play uh, cover up. And I think she has actually saved the image of the city. Well, 
answers. Thank you. I'll just be very brief, Claire, but thanks for those uh, two good questions. I think that, that Joe Merkel, that's an interesting one. I mean, in a way, I'd be tempted to say uh, transformational against transactional leader, because that would be, that would clearly situate that within a, a certain literature. And, and there's a bit of that, actually, although we shouldn't maybe overplay Thatcher's uh, transformational nature. I mean, the first 18 to 20, 24 months of her premiership were extremely difficult and she she grew into transformationism in a sense and i suppose we might, we might also say of course a german leader you know we, we're talking about merkel but if we think about schroeder for example then we could say virtual fact that far-reaching policy reform is is possible in the german system i mean schroeder actually you know left uh, a substantial legacy in that area. So uh, that would be my 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 brief thoughts uh, uh, on on that. Um, uh, for the historical legacy, I think she she would be remembered as the longest serving chancellor. So sixteen years is nothing to be just wiped away. Even though you believe that the legacy is uh, not uh, that significant. But she was, for 15 consecutive years, the top of the list of the Forbes most powerful women. And I think somehow it will be remembered. So I'm not quite, um, I don't know whether uh, this uh, uh, argument of, uh, of what happened between 2015 and 2021, Europe has changed tremendously. And that was, that coincided with the Merkel era. So whether we like it or not, whether we uh, assess her achievements, uh, being significant or impactful enough, I don't know, but her era coincided with years that were very significant in terms of changes inside the EU, so it will go down into this history with her. So, I, I also yes, yeah, yeah. Add something no. about the, the legacy no. issue. Um, um, as a German myself, I do live in Hong Kong for 37 years. I watch Germany from, from the distance. And uh, I can see that please, please sorry, yeah, and, and I can see watching Germany from the distance over the decade. I can see that uh, um, yeah, Germany has uh, definitely changed Germany a lot, uh, especially the, the role of women uh, feminism in Germany. Uh, Merkel never um, openly took a very strongly feminist stand. But she always promoted uh, women, supported women, her uh, uh, um, minister for, for women and family affairs, uh, let them do much, much more than Schroeder did for the socialist government before. And, um, and also by the very fact that she is a woman on top, uh, a generation of Germans has uh, grown up uh, seeing that the leader of the country is a woman and that the number of uh, ministers in the cabinet has increased, female ministers has increased to almost half now. Um, so I think uh, if you look at Germany, the, the attitude towards uh, feminism, also the attitude towards homosexuality has changed tremendously under, under her time. And I think it's not just the time, it's also her influence. Um, I also agree with you about the, the, the um, Christianity. She is a Protestant. Her Christianity is different from the Christianity of Armin Laschet or Henry Cole. But um, I think that the decision that she made uh, with, the, with the refugees was strongly influenced by her Christian background uh, of, of uh, helping people. And I think this, uh, also I agree with everything that you said, has uh, added a lot of soft power. So if I see how people, when I'm as a German here and I talk, how people react to that, uh, many have a lot of respect for that. Even though I also agree it was badly managed within the European Union, but it was uh, something Germany didn't want to in intervene military in terms of military in Syria, but they said this is our contribution. And, and this is one thing is the soft power, the other thing is what has also changed German society. Uh, I always found German society is very German. Compared to French or British or French, it is quite monocultural, but even though they were Turkish, and, and, and but I think that has changed. Uh, it, there was a majority support for, for letting in these people, there was a lot of activism of people supporting and helping the, the refugees. And I think this has, uh, has changed uh, also the society, has opened up the society, made it more liberal. So I think from the, from the 
domestic perspective, uh, uh, Germany has changed uh, uh, not only during her term, but, but because of, of who she is. Um, okay, great. I should talk to you, but <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you for our participants here. Thank you for our participants online. Thank you for our panelists and uh, to Emily and uh, Alistair and all the other BU colleagues who are here with us in the room here for traveling out here. We want to make this uh, a more permanent feature, a periodic but permanent feature of, uh, of our engagement and mutual cooperation. So we, you shall all hear announcements about the next events in due time. So thank you all very thank much you, for this. Thank you, Ronan. Thank you.